Welcome to our 10th episode of One Work, Five Questions with Dr. M. Andrew Holacek and your host, Donna Vitek. Thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Holacek. Glad as always to be here on this. This is the Sunday night version. Yes, yes. The evening. So it's very nice to do this in the evening, different times of the day. Um, Dr. Holacek is a PhD retired professor of philosophy and history and the world's foremost scholar in Thomas Jefferson. Um, he has written over 20 published books and over 100 essays on Thomas Jefferson. He's also the editor of Journal of Thomas Jefferson and His Time. Um, he's, his list of books and locations of his published essays can be found in the video description. With our show One Work, Five Questions, I'll ask Dr. Holacek five questions on one work of Thomas Jefferson. Our 10th episode is Thomas Jefferson's views on generational sovereignty in his letter to James Madison, dated September 6, 1789. But first, let me give you a brief introduction to the topic. Dr. Holacek, you stated in our last session that grasping the gist of this letter was critical to grasping um, Jefferson's political philosophy. So we are here doing this long and I'd say rather technically difficult letter from Jefferson to his dear friend and political disciple, James Madison. I hope that Dr. Holacek's pledge that it'll pay dividends is correct because I have to say reading and rereading the letter gave me one of Jefferson's head acts. Yeah, he, uh, he had periodic headaches throughout his life at uh at uh, moments of great stress, death of his mother and things like that. And uh, um, he spelled headache as two words and the last one was A-C-H-S. Mm -hmm. No E there, but things were a little different in this time. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, well, thank you for that interesting information. Um, okay, are you ready for question number one, Dr. Holacek? I guess so. Okay. In the letter, Jefferson asks whether one generation of men has a right to bind another. He begins on a supposition deemed self-evident that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, that the dead have neither powers nor rights over it. What precisely does he mean by that? It's a very, as you mentioned, it's a very difficult letter. Um, so I'll go through, I'll, let me give a sort of systematic, if I can answer that question. Okay. Uh, first, it should be mentioned that this is a singular letter because Jefferson is writing to Madison and has one thought on his mind. That's this notion of usufruct, generational sovereignty. Usufruct being the notion, um, the fruits of the usage of something. So when we're talking about um, um, earth belongs in, Usufruct to the living, we have we say we're saying the earth belongs through the fruits of its being used to the living, whatever okay. fruits it can give, usefulness, useful fruits. So now none other than the great Merrill Peterson, who was the second Thomas Jefferson um, historian at University of Virginia, wrote of this letter mm -hmm. um, and wrote of this notion of generational sovereignty, which will um, expatiate on throughout this talk, this, uh, this event here, he says this was the most and the most, most original and the most radical of Jefferson's political ideas. And that's saying a lot from Merrill Peterson. The scenario is something like this. Jefferson has us imagine a scenario when everybody that exists is born on a particular day, everyone reaches maturity on a particular day, everyone dies on the same day. To understand what he means by the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, we could understand at some point that one generation has no, um, cannot bind the next generation to, uh, through its debts, things like that. So usufruct in some sense entails no encumbrance of debt, on transference of, say, of property, um, because transference of debt, right, entails that the earth belongs to the dead, not to the living. Okay. So it follows that no generation can contract debts, for example, that bind the next generation. The idea here is um, 
Well, I'll, I'll explain further when I refer to certain quotes that I've collected just to, but the idea here is the dead, if, if they can bind you at a certain debt, they in some sense have, a, the dead people have an influence over the living, affairs of the living. And he wants to argue that makes no sense. And I'll, I'll get clear on that argument. So this scenario that he proposes really is worthless because not everybody's born on the same day, matures the same day. Right. You know, and dies on the same day. So he's got to say, okay, how do we define a generation? So he appeals to the mortuary tables of uh, uh, Comte de Buffon. And Buffon notes that given a certain population of people, uh, half, half of the people uh, over within 18 years and eight months. So he's using that point, that 18 years, eight months, and when half of the people die, rounds it out to 19 years as a definition for a generation. And I have a quote here. He says, the 19 years is the term beyond which neither the representatives of a nation nor even the whole nation itself assembled can validly, ex validly extend the debt. Okay, now imagine at 21 years of age, I take out a large loan, right? pay none of it back. And, you know, at the end of my 19 years or so, uh, I die. I squander the money, uh, have done nothing to pay it back. I die at the age, you know, 19 years, I die at the age of 40. What happens with this huge debt? Well, the debt would go to my eldest son who inherits my property. And Jefferson, you know, in, in some sense, rightfully says that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Everybody realized that it doesn't make a lot of sense because it's binding. In other words, the son is responsible for the sins of the father. Now you have your, um, your argument up here, and this is in just what goes on. He says, the earth in use effect belongs to the living. Premise what? Well, that makes sense if we understand that. Uh, in other words, the living people are the ones who should enjoy the fruits of the earth. Now, if debts can be transferred to a next generation, then the dead have an influence on earthly affairs. So if I die at 40 and all my massive debts go on to my son, in some, in, in, a, in a sense, my son is not free to do whatever he wants to do with his life. He's, right. Jim Jefferson felt this when his father-in-law died, John Wales. He was, uh, he inherited cumbrous debt. So he wasn't free to do what he wanted to do. He was in some sense forced to try to have to pay off those debts. So he says, if they can be transfer transferred, then the dead have an influence over earthly affairs. That contradicts premise one. So there can be no transference of debt. So that when the person dies, if he didn't pay off his debts, then that's that. that there's no responsibility of the next generation to do that. Now that's a, clearly not what goes on, right? Um, now, I want to read and uh, have uh, listeners bear with me. I have about five quotes I've amassed here on this that say the same thing in different language at a later. This is 1789. Keep that in mind. Now, one objection is scholars have said, well, Jefferson, you know, uh, Madison, we're going to see objects, offer certain telling objections. And some will say, well, Jefferson really didn't take this seriously uh, after Madison's objections. That's not true. Sam Kirchival, 12 July, 1816. We've seen this letter before, haven't we? Yes. He said, the dead, but the dead have no rights. They are nothing and nothing cannot own something. Where there is no substance, he's waxing metaphysical here, okay? Where there's no substance, there can be no accident. An accident is a property, an accidental property of something. This corporate globe and everything upon it belong to the present corporeal, corporeal's fleshy inhabitants during their generation. They alone have a right to direct what is the concern of themselves alone and to declare the law of that direction. This declaration can only be made by the majority. So he says that in 1816. 1818 to Joseph C. Cabell, Senator Joseph Cabell, who, uh, Cabell, excuse me. Uh, nobody more strong than myself advocates the right of every generation to legislate for itself and the advantages which each succeeding a generation has over the preceding one from the constant progress of the science and the arts. Now, brings in sciences and the arts. Every generation is going to be artistically and scientifically more advanced than the one prior to it, on average. So 
there needs to be, they need to be free to legislate mm -hmm. as they wish to legislate. So there is a governmental thing here, right? We talk about constitutional renewal, that the new government does not want to be hampered by an, an outdated constitution, for example. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to that more. Okay. 1823, this is three years prior to his death. He says, our creator made the earth for the use of the living and not of the dead, that those who exist not can have no use nor right to it, no authority or power over it, that one generation of men cannot foreclose its birth and its use to another, which comes to it in its own right and by the same divine benevolence, that a preceding generation cannot bind a succeeding one by its laws or contracts, these deriving their obligation from the will of the existing majority, which is what he said in the prior letter, right? So the idea here, this is something, a right, he's arguing, a natural right, God guaranteed. And Jefferson does that quite a bit. I won't read the rest of this quote. Let me move on to the other two that I have. 1824 to John Hampton Pleasants. I willingly acquiesce in the institutions of my country, perfect or imperfect, and think it a duty to leave their modifications to those who are to live under them and are to participate of the good or evil they may produce. The present generation has the same right of self-government which the past one has exercised for itself. And those in the full vigor of body and mind are more able to judge for themselves than those who are sinking under the weight of both. If the sense of our citizens on the subject of a convention can be fairly and fully taken, it results will, I am sure, be wise and salutary and far from arrogating uh, the office of advice, no one will more passively acquiesce in it, right? The idea is the next generation not only needs to be free, they are on average smarter, sharper, uh, have new ideas, and they can't be hampered by the prior generation, politically or otherwise. Okay. Lastly, this is again 1824, two years before his death. So clearly still thinks this principle, you know, takes us to his death. Can constitutions be made unchangeable? Can one generation bind another and all others in succession forever? I think not. The creator has made the earth for the living, not for the dead. Rights and powers can only belong to persons, not to things, not to mere matter unendowed with will. The dead are not even things. The particles of matter, he was a <laughs> corpuscularian, he believes in everything was like Newton, was just made up of atoms, which compose their bodies, make part now of the bodies of other animals, vegetables, or minerals of a thousand forms. To what then are attached the rights and powers they held while in the form of men? So the idea here, without reading the rest of it, is the idea is. When people are dead, they're nothing. If they still have an influence over the living, then it's nothing having an influence over something, to speak metaphysically, and nothing can have no influence over something by nature. So he wants to argue by nature and metaphysically, if nothing literally can have an influence on something, we are socially allowing dead people, right, by binding them with the debts of their forebears, uh, allowing nothing to have an influence on something. At least that's the okay. argument. Hmm. Okay. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. I hope so, because I have no idea what I just said. It leads me to more questions, but I won't do that. I'll stick to I'll stick to our um, okay. <laughs> predetermined okay. questions. It's not, an easy, uh, it's not an easy letter to understand. It really no, it is. It it, it isn't. Um, I, I would love to have a conversation with him and ask him <laughs> what he meant by certain things. Question number two, Jefferson then adds that what is true of every member of the society individually is true of them all collectively, since the rights of the whole can be no more than the sum of the rights of individuals. Is that sound reasoning? Not really. In logic, this is generally construed to be a compositional fallacy. Um, okay. And you can see it if I give you a simple example. You see it in sports, for example, a lot of uh, sport teams. Imagine a baseball team collecting only of, of the very best players. Mm -hmm. 
uh, does that if, if every person on the team is a good player, does that mean that the team will be very, very good? Well, if everyone is a good player that's on the team, then yeah, the team should be. Well, does the team have to be good because everyone's a good player? I would say there's uh, a probability that I'm it would be. I'm not asking about probabilities. I'm asking if everybody is definitely a good player, does that mean the team is definitely a good team? I would say yes. Well, actually, no. Give oh. me a, a simpler example. You know, you see many examples of, of people loading up their teams with great players in the team. You've got all the egos. You're not. Well, let me give you a simpler example. Okay. Uh, imagine someone who likes beef stew. And I want to make the best beef stew. So I'm going to put nothing but the finest ingredients. Okay. I'm going to put nothing other than something that's tasty. So I put in beef, boil the beef, throw in some onions and carrots, chopped up green peppers, some celery, a little salt, pepper to taste, um, some potatoes. Um, I love all those things. Every one of the things I put in, I really like. Very tasty. So the stew has to be tasty because of things. I love chocolate ice cream. So I put in a pint of chocolate ice cream. I like beer pretzels, I put them in. In fact, I like old number 38 stout. So I pour in two bottles of stout in there, okay? And you know, I like popcorn, cheese popcorn. So I throw in some cheese popcorn into my stew. You get the idea. Everything I put in is very tasty to me. Is the stew going to be tasty? No. Not in this case. So you can see that it's a compositional fallacy. Now, it's not that the reasoning necessarily, the argument's form is no good, but it's not that the argument's not persuasive. What I mean by that, Jefferson should have said, he, Jefferson says something like this. Because it's true of each member, it's true of the whole. He's using an argument form. And, and if he, he should have gotten away from that and said something different, mm -hmm. like it is true of each member, okay, um, that the rights that you know that are enjoyed by each member are the same rights that are enjoyed by the whole now that doesn't follow he should say something like because it's true of each member it is true of each member and it happens too to be true of the whole it's not that it being true of each member makes the whole has an effect on the whole but it happens to be true of each member and it happens also to be true of the whole so in this case it, it does sort of work when you think about what is true of every member of the society individually, namely the sort of rights there to enjoy life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, um, right of revolution or something. Mm -hmm. It's true of the whole. In some sense, you'd want to say life, liberty, pursuit of happiness is, okay. is something that the country should enjoy as well. So now it's a, um, it, it's a compositional fallacy, but if he didn't, presented in the form of argument, I think he would have been better served because the argument doesn't work, but the gist of what he's trying to convey does make sense in this case. Okay. So what, what he's trying to say anyway is he gives the argument from inheriting debt from individual perspectives, like a, a father having a lot of money through a loan, spending it, and then the children, when he dies, have to pay off the loan. That's not fair to the children because they are not free. They have to pay off the debt like Jefferson did. Uh, he wants to take that, so it's the same thing of nations. Okay. A nation can't, a generation in a nation can't go off and, and behave irresponsibly and then, you know, throw the burdens to the next generation. It's not fair as well. So what applies to individuals applies to nation, applies to groups of people as well. So that's what he means by that. Okay. Okay. So it's a bad argument, but the sentiment itself, if he just said it happens what's true of each uh, member, the rights of each member happen also to be the rights of collective groups like nations and stuff. Okay. Question number three, what are some of the benefits of this principle of generational sovereignty? Well, you, um, you, you know, if you think about it, you can think about many different results, many different benefits. The first obvious one is that Jefferson's a in Lockean liberal, right? He wants people to be free and nations to be free. And if a nation goes off and behaves poorly, gets into massive debt, 
the look what happened when Reagan took office. He made a pledge to try to chip away at the national debt, and you know, turned out that he couldn't do that because of the Star Wars and everything else. But uh -huh. <clears throat> the notion, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the notion is that individuals are born free, <clears throat> and nations too have the same liberties that individuals should have. <clears throat> so. Um, it's consistent with his liberalism. We want freedom of individuals. If they are in, settled with debt, they're not free. Same with nations. Okay. Secondly, it's a check on war. Okay. He wants to say that a constitution in a constitution, you cannot borrow from another country any more than you can repay within a span of 19 years, one generation. Right. Now, if you're going to behave responsibly and pay your debt within 19 years, that's a preventative of war. One, one of the sparks of war Jefferson's hinting at here is one country abusing its privileges with another country, having debts and can't pay the debts. So the country okay. at some point says, hell with it, we're going to war. You can't recover the debts, we're gonna, we're gonna plunder. Okay. Third one I found very interesting is it riddance of revolution. Okay. What I mean by that. If you sit down and you have every generation, every 19 years, you have constitutional renewal through delegates uh, from the states that talk about how the constitution should be changed or altered. They're all the points of the constitution need to be thought about again. Are they still relevant for this generation? You're gonna reduce the probability of revolutions. Revolutions are aimed at coercive abuses of a government but if the government itself sits down and does sort of what Jefferson calls a self catechizing, if, 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 uh, if governments themselves sit down and, and do their own house cleaning, cleaning every generation, change the laws, um, it, you know, this is going to prevent, const, uh, uh, prevent revolutions. And I think he's right there. Um, now, you also have the notion of he believes that every generation is his on average, getting smarter, wiser, um, more innovative and things like that. And whether that's true or not, he doesn't say necessarily, but on average, right? Uh -huh. uh, so we, we get a principle that ties in with not only the constitutional renewal about which we talked, but also about human progress. No society says he can make a perpetual constitution or perpetual law. That means each generation that comes into government can generate can can legislate as it wants to legislate. They're not burdened by, you know. You take the Constitution of the United States. We talked last time about you know Second Amendment. You know the right to bear arms. Uh -huh. Does that hold universally? A lot of people go back to you know, the amendments and the principles of the Constitution and say, you know, let's appeal to the Constitution. And Jefferson would laugh at that. Uh -huh. and, you know, why do you think the people that put this together, you know, in, in the late, you know, 1700s have greater wisdom than the current people? So why do we have to appeal to this as if this is some sort of inviolable uh, set of rules? Right. Absolutely right there. Okay, so he wants to say at the end of every 19 years, we're going to he says, uh, and he says this in his letter, the wars of one generation are not the wars of the next. Imagine we're at war, then a new generation comes in, uh, the next generation say, the hell with that. We're not interested in the war and so forth. Now that's kind of weird. Imagine you're involved, uh, imagine, let's take the Russian-Ukrainian war. Imagine it just happens in the 18th year uh, and then in, in the 19th year, you know, um, there's a new generation of Soviet, or I say Soviet, Russian leaders come in and uh -huh. they just say, well, the wars, you know, you're, are you going to just stop something right in the middle of doing something? It's hard to say, but I mean, when you're involved or if you're involved in any sort of talk about dogs, there's my dog. Like that. Jeffy. <laughs> He wants this to apply to copyrights and inventions, and he argues they're not cannot be a protection. I notice what Hamilton does when Hamilton becomes Secretary of Treasurer. He wants to bring in the British model with Bank of the United States, all these banks, 
and have debts. Uh, it's like our credit system today is that you establish your credit by paying off your, your, your debts, but a good debt, a large national debt for Hamilton is a very good thing because it establishes the authority of a centralized government. We, the particular states and you know, own or people owe the, the government so much, the government act, has authority. Um, that all crumbles, that Hamiltonian structure crumbles in some sense that every generation the debts have to be erased. So, uh -huh. and then lastly, what do you do? You know, it goes back to people say Jefferson didn't do more on slavery. Um, and he worked, as we know, well up to his second term presidency to rid of the uh, decenterous institution. Yet nonetheless, his argument would be, and people don't want to hear that, I've done more than my share over decades. Right. It's the next generation. You know, first off, the next generation has to sit down and figure out, do they want to rid of slavery or not? And in his opinion, they did it. It wasn't his ball game anymore. Right. It, the next generations was. This is why it's an important letter. You can bitch at Jefferson, but if you understand that this is a principle that he never, never uh, abolished or, or rid of, then it gives you a very simple answer. It's not my job anymore. I've done. I went above and beyond what I can do to rid of this vicinous, this evil, wicked institution. The next generation has to decide whether they want to abolish slavery or not, come up with a plan. I've got other things to do. So it's, that's a very interesting topic. And, and he did. He did advise. Um, um, I, I can't remember the senator's name. He did advise a senator to work towards abolishing slavery or it would cause serious problems for our country later on if it if it didn't happen i think it was john holmes was it john holmes Could have been, yeah yeah, yeah. so um it was something that was i think on the forefront of his mind um it was always there but the point is you know you can look climate change is at the forefront of everybody's minds mm -hmm. so what do you do People don't want, nations don't want to do anything because it means, you know, we're already in a economic slump globally because of the war. And then people come around and say, we have this other problem, climate change, which is a bugbear. Uh, uh, but people are bitching about groceries are expensive, gas is expensive. And the idea is we can understand something is wicked, needs to be abolished, but put yourself in the moment. You're a Southern plantation owner and it's like, okay, I have, if I have an enormous plantation, I might have 150 slaves and each might be, you know, many, many hundreds of dollars. You're asking me to lose all my assets. You're asking me to get rid of um, money that I'd spent on these people that are working for me. Okay, we know today that's a bad thing. And they probably knew it was a bad thing then, but that was part of the culture. And how do you get rid of the institution without crippling the Southern economy, which again was fueling the Northern economy with cotton and, and farm right. goods? And stuff, so, right, and we know it was something that wasn't going to be done overnight, and it, it needed time and very good planning. Um, yeah. Question number four: Jefferson has asked Madison to mull over the contents of the letter um, with that person vacuity and cogent logic, which is so peculiar, peculiarly peculiar, um, yours. Madison replies five months later on February 4th, 1790. What yeah, was Jefferson, this? you know, that perspicuity and cogent logic, which is so peculiarly yours, he says to Madison, that tells you uh, that he has profound respect for for Madison's uh, logical acumen. And he asked, remember the whole letter, he's asking his friend uh, M Madison to uh, to read through the letter. You're worried about your dog barking, right? Yeah, disrupting the video. <laughs> Jefferson, you know, Jefferson had a very soft voice. He could not carry in an assembly or even when he was in a court case. and. Not this Jefferson. He's a little thing, but with a very large mouth. I thought you were talking about the dog. We're talking about the dog, yeah. <laughs> went, went from the ex-lawyer president to the dog. 
Anyway, so Madison has some very telling objections. Um, one of which is, you, you know, the extent to which they're cogent, I'll let listeners judge. One of which he says, you know, having frequent constitutional changes would lead to political instability, not political stability. No, is that legitimate? Jefferson's arguing for, you know, I don't think this is a very, very telling objection because Jefferson is arguing basically every 20 years, you sit down and you evaluate the constitution. Mm -hmm. And the objection here that, that Madison gives suggests that, you know, the whole idea is radical changes to it. I don't think Jefferson thinks that's gonna happen. He just thinks, look, you know, we need to go over the whole thing. It, it, does it need to be some tweaking? He doesn't think that the next generation is gonna have such radically new ideas that the whole thing needs to be overhauled. So I don't see this as a very telling objection. Okay. Second one is, he says, Jefferson is arguing that the state of nature and the civil state are significantly different. So Jefferson is bringing in a civil matter, whether or not, you know, we ought to transfer, debts ought to be transferable to the next generation, things like that. That's a civil matter. Jefferson's making it a physical matter, a natural matter. He's talking about the laws of nature. God made it that way. You know, and he'll say in some of those things, um, here's a, a, a quote I have. By the law of nature, one, the law of nature, one generation is to another as one independent nation. So he's talking about this as a natural law. And in other of the quotes I said, it's an axiom, he said. I can't tell you. If I tell you that the dead are nothing and nothing can't influence something, you know, that, that's again a very bad argument once again, because he says they're nothing, physically nothing, because they're physically nothing. Something that's physically nothing cannot uh, physically affect something that's something. That makes sense. But the effect that the dead are having is not a physical effect. It's a sort of civil or social effect, namely that they've left behind debts. The debts are not physical things. Uh -huh. They're social problems. And so again, we have a bad argument by Thomas Jefferson by, by taking, by, you know, he does this a lot at times. He says, it's the law of nature. We, we are by nature given life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. He, so he puts it in God's lap. So in, in effect, anybody who disagrees with him is saying, well, you know, God didn't make it that way. Uh -huh. and, uh, you know, so he's, uh, so he says, uh, th this is a, an argument I like from Madison, he says, the, the deceased leave more than debts to the living. They leave behind improvements. If we can't transfer debts, what about improvements? I leave behind, you know, imagine I take Monticello, it's in a state of decay, it's left to me. I put in, today I put in millions of dollars into it, fix it all up and I leave it to my offspring, uh, but does my offspring deserve to get everything earned, inherit what I fixed? Because the dead are influenced and living in the same way. This is a fairly telling objection, it seems to me. So what about, you know, what about improvements we make? So we take the improvements away for the next generation? <laughs> you know, so that's a, a, a interesting. Um, Another one is Madison says many debts are is sort of important. Imagine when the debt incurred in the Revolutionary War. Now that's gonna be a debt that's not gonna be paid off within 19 years. Ought we demand that it has to be paid off in 19 years because it's such a critical war. Um, and Madison, I'll read something that Madison sums here. He says, all that is indispensable in adjusting the account between the dead and the living is to see that the debits against the latter do not exceed the advances made by the former. Okay. Um, so it, it, Madison comes up with some objections that prove quite problematic, some not so much, some very much problematic, and Jefferson does not write back. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have assumed that, okay, you know, Madison had objections and Jefferson takes him to heart. He doesn't want to push this. Jefferson just doesn't listen to anything Madison says. Mm -hmm. Even the, the objections that are telling, he doesn't address those objections. But as I've shown in letters all the way to 1824, two years before he died, he's giving advice about how the dead have no influence on the living. 
and how this is part of his political philosophy. So um, Madison does offer some telling objections. Jefferson does not reply to them. They never bring, you know, Madison politely never brings this up again. He know he probably hurt his buddy's feelings. Oh, <laughs> wow. Never say that again. <laughs> I'm not, not talking about that. Are you ready for question number five? I am ready, fire away. Many of Thomas Jefferson's arguments in favor of generational sovereignty seem sensible in spite of difficulties and application and James Madison's objections, can the principle be salvaged? Can generational sovereignty be salvaged? Now, that's a very intriguing question, is it not? Because you know, we, we noted there are problems in application. Yes. But it does seem so very sensible that we don't want to saddle the next generation. If I'm a parent, for example, I don't want to live in such a way so that my I, I enjoy my life to such an extent I live in such debt that my children had to pay it off. That's not fair to them. No. So I have an ob so I mean, can we salvage this somehow? And I, I don't know how you salvage it. I, I am very much intrigued by generational sovereignty. It it asks for, and it, it might be that the answer to it is that we adopt it as a principle that cannot be um, cannot be employed perfectly. It cannot be perfectly employed, but what we can do is we can approximate it again. The problem is that, that with that argument, as a philosopher, I'm in the habit of throwing out solutions and then destroying the solution. That's just what we do for a living. <laughs> Leave you with a nasty taste in your mouth, thinking, "Oh shit, there's no, we're not getting anywhere." No, I mean that's a possibility, but the problem with that, there's the you know snowballing argument that uh, there are times like when when Jefferson had a strict constructionist approach to the Constitution, and then you get the possibility of buying, you know, increasing twofold the size of the of the um, of the country. Is he going to do it? Right. right. And so the point is, there's no constitutional warrant, right, for, for the Louisiana purchase. Mm -hmm. And Jefferson knew it. He wanted to make an amendment to the Constitution, talked of this before, but he doesn't do it because there's not time. He's advised by Albert Gallatin, hey, you know, Napoleon might change his mind. We need to strike while the air is hot. We need to buy this damn thing while it's cheap and, you know, get it for nothing. So the idea is, is that once you say, well, there are certain occasions in which we can have a, a slippery approach to interpreting the constitution that leads very easily to someone coming up and say, we should have a slippery interpretation more often. Right. And then all of a sudden it became, becomes a lump of moldable clay. The words mean nothing. So that's my answer to that. I, I like in general, the gist of what he's trying to do. And maybe there are ways of salvaging it or approximating his ideals. The problem with that is that in trying to do so, Maybe uh, we, maybe we, uh, you know, maybe this whole notion of approximation just won't be done. It's just going to be that uh, we fall back into the same mistakes that we're falling into now. Hmm. That's my answer. That's the best I can give. Maybe it's not a happy, happy, happy answer, but it's an answer. Yeah. Well, not everything is going to be happy. This this was a a big undertaking, our, our country building everything and and coming up with a way to amend the Constitution for the future generations. Um, I think that, that's what I like. That's what I think. What you just said is what I like about what he's trying to do is that let's put it into the law of the land. <laughs> Well, let's, let's put it in, if you can, put it into the Constitution itself that the document needs to be revised or we need it to say that we have to have a Constitution re revision every once in a while. It doesn't mean it has to be changed in the least. It just means you have to sit down and discuss have circumstances change such that some of these principles are obsolete, number one, or that, you know, some of them need to be tweaked or modified. Right. My view is, unlike Madison who thinks it's going to lead to chaos. It's not going to lead to chaos. It's a very healthy thing. It's probably going to prevent revolutions in a democracy. Right. I, I think as we're seeing today, um, too, with some um, people would like to change the wording of our constitution, which if it's if it goes through the 
amendment process and gets the votes and it, it, it's done correctly, then that's what needs to be done. Yeah, yeah, and he's just, he's absolutely right to say, yeah. you know, I've listened to so much talk radio and it makes me throw up sometimes when people always, the argument they always give, but our constitution says this. And I wanna say, so what? I mean, you know, you need to appeal to it as the law of the land. We need to respect that. But it doesn't mean that what someone wrote 2000, uh, 2000, 200 something years ago, yeah. these people have a wisdom that far exceeds us. No, they didn't. Right. So we need to sit back and think if their words need to be changed. They gave us a great start. Yeah, yeah. And let's use it as Jefferson said and build on it. So that's, that's what I got to say. So I don't have anything more to say on it. So, uh, Okay. I, I want to add the last thing is this is so important to understand Jefferson's political thought. If you want to say Jefferson didn't take this seriously, you're wrong. When you understand what he says in his political philosophy, this principle is an axiom. God made it so that it's self-evident that the dead can't influence the living. So there has to be generational sovereignty. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Holacek. That, that makes the letter a little easier to swallow. <laughs> okay, so um, now looking forward, um, I want to discuss what's coming up for us. Um, Thomas Jefferson, though he took in the children of best friend Dabney Carr on Carr's death and treated his sons-in-law as sons, never had his own son. But he did have a grandson whom he loved dearly. While president on the 24th of November, 1808, he wrote a lengthy letter to grandson and namesake Thomas Jefferson Randolph, who was then 16. What sort of fatherly advice did Thomas Jefferson give to his beloved grandson? If you wish to know that answer, tune in next week to One Work, Five Questions with me, your host, Donna Vitek, and my weekly guest, Dr. Mark Andrew Holacek. That's, uh, thank you, Don. That's going to be on the lighter side. I chose that. So we, this is heavy. I know you had your head act. <laughs> gave me a head act. <laughs> trying to figure out, you know, a lot of numbers here we didn't talk about. But this is something lighter. He loved. Thomas Jefferson Randolph wound up not being, as we would say today, the brightest bulb in the chandelier. But he had a heart of gold. His grandfather loved him dearly, like his own son, loved him dearly, and he loved his grandfather dearly. Uh, I would love at some point, if I uh, have enough years left in other projects, is to have something to say about, if only a paper, about the relationship between the two, because they loved each other and respected each other. Uh, and this is him giving his grandson fatherly advice, and I won't say anything about that, so get it. But just understand that this is someone whom he loved dearly. I cannot wait to hear because I'm very curious to um, see what kind of advice he would give to um, a grandson versus having daughters. So uh, this will be very interesting, um, a very interesting topic. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. What have I done here <laughs> to our video? I'm trying to get it small for our um, for for our exit. Um, well, please if not leave it. You can also leave it large and just uh, uh, starting words. But uh... oh, okay. Oh, well, I just removed me <laughs> from okay. the video. I can still see you, so you're fine. Oh, okay. Um, if you'd like to contact Dr. Um, Holacek for as a guest speaker uh, at your university, your school, um, any events that you may have coming up, you can reach him at mholacek at hotmail.com or his Facebook page, Thomas Jefferson, Bring Him Home to Monticello, Citizens for Change. And I'd and like if to- you want, If you want an autographed copy of my book, Did Thomas Jefferson Really Father Any of Sally Hemings Black Children? You can contact me via mholacek at Hotmail. And for $35, you will get an autographed copy. And that includes mailing, as long as in your, you're in the United States. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yes. They're, they're going like hotcakes. I yes. Know that's, that's not quite true, but- uh, yeah, some of them are selling, so it's, it's a very good book. You'll, you'll enjoy it. 
yeah, that's. Um, oh, thank you for having me on. Oh, you're welcome. It's it's my pleasure. It's always a, a joy to spend time talking about Thomas Jefferson. It is, but uh, yeah, cutting the grass today, going for a long bike ride. I'm a little, as you can see, I got a little bit of sun today, so. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> but, uh, I can I can always get excited about Thomas Jefferson at some point. It's just a wonderful <laughs> letter, and it was a good show. Thank you very much. We'll do this cool. again. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you for, for being here. And I'm looking forward to next week. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. <laughs>